We're live. Thank you. Sergeants, can you please start your recordings? PC started. Cloud is started. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Martinez, would your opening statement, please? Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at council testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that email address is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We're ready to begin. Ready? Good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegy, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. Today, the committee will hear seven bills. I'll introduce each bill in turn. First, intro 354, sponsored by Council Member Helen Rosenthal, would increase penalties for demolishing or altering a building without a Department of Buildings issued permit when such a building is calendared for consideration by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Second, intro 1127 sponsored by Council Member Holden would require the Department of Buildings to expedite work permits where they are necessary for ongoing work to proceed. This legislation would also require DOB to expedite amendments to permit applications. Third, intro number 1336 sponsored by Council Member Moya will require the Department of Buildings to collect information regarding insurance coverage available at construction sites and to store this information in a public online database. Fourth, intro number 1635, sponsored by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, will require the Public Design Commission to solicit works of art from the public for possible display on sidewalk sheds at construction sites. Fifth, intro number 1667, sponsored by Council Member Steve Levin, will require contractors to report on environmentally monitoring of construction or demolition work to both DOB and the Department of Environmental Protection. This legislation would also require contractors to post this environmental monitoring information at construction sites. Sixth, intro number 1737, sponsored by Council Member Rivera, will require that an after hours variance issued for public safety purposes expire 15 days after issuance. It would also limit the number of days um, uh, an AHB application could request an AHB, restrict the hours for which an AHB could be issued and require DEP to provide written explanations for its AHB issuance decisions. DEP could be required to report to the council annually on administration of AHB process. Finally, we'll hear proposed intro number 1939A sponsored by council member Alan Mizell, this legislation will require newly constructed and substantially renovated nursing homes, adult homes, enriched housing, and certain assisted living facilities to have standby power sufficient to run essential appliances and utilities for no less than 72 hours. I look forward to hearing testimony related to these bills from the Department of Buildings and interested members of the public. Uh, before we move on, I want to acknowledge the presence of my colleagues. I can't see them, so if someone else, uh, preferably, uh, uh, committee Council uh, would identify the members. Sure. Right now we have Council Members Lewis, um, Perkins, Rosenthal, and Jonai. Thank you. I'd like to also, I'd like to thank my colleagues from the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'd also like to thank bill sponsors for who, who are present today. For those who have opening statements, we'll hear those statements during the question and answer portion of the hearing following administration testimony. Thank you. Thanks, Chair Cornegy. Um, I'm Austin Branford. I'm counsel to the City Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We'll be limiting council member questions to three minutes, including responses. Bill sponsors making opening statements during the Q&A portion of the hearing will have five minutes. 
We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, which will be followed by council member questions, beginning with the sponsors of the bills we are hearing today. This will be followed by testimony from members of the public. From the administration, we will hear from the Department of Buildings, represented by Commissioner Melanie LaRocca. I'll now minister the oath. After the oath, I will call on you to affirm for the record. Commissioner LaRocca, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Oh, we can't hear you. We seem to have lost audio. Yes. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Sorry. You can start when you're ready. Good morning, Chair Cornegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'm Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings, and I'm pleased to be here to discuss the legislation before the committee, which touches on several different aspects of our work. Intro 354 creates a new penalty for altering or demolishing a building that has been calendared by the Landmarks Preservation Commission without a permit issued by the department. We take very seriously any construction work that occurs without a required permit and support imposing penalties where building calendared by LPC is altered or demolished without a permit. Intro 1127 requires the department to issue permits within five days where work on a building is in progress and additional permits are needed to proceed with such work. The department is opposed to this legislation given that it presents operational challenges and does not improve upon existing processes. Permit applications are reviewed and permits are issued in the order for which they are applied. This proposal could result in disruptions to service levels for our customers seeking to begin a project or continue a construction project. It should also be noted that we review applications submitted in connection with construction projects expeditiously and can issue permits shortly thereafter. Additionally, applications submitted to the department can be professionally certified by a registered design professional, in which case a permit could be issued instantaneously. Last year, we also launched our online customer service dashboard, which is a new online tool that allows the public to understand the wait times they should expect when starting a construction project. Intro 1366 requires the department to collect insurance information from contractors to make such information available online. We support this legislation as it enhances our current practice and continues our commitment to transparency. Contractors are required to submit proof that they, com that they comply with applicable insurance requirements at the time they are seeking a license or registering with the department. And that insurance must be maintained when they are engaging in a construction project. Intro 1635 allows for art to, dis to be displayed on temporary construction equipment which includes sidewalk sheds and construction fences. Temporary construction equipment is required to protect the public from construction activity, but there is no reason why these structures can't be beautiful as well. The City Canvas pro Pilot pro Program, pardon me, which we have implemented in collaboration with our partners at the Department of Cultural Affairs, already allows for art on certain temporary construction equipment. It is a great example of how art and temporary construction equipment can come together to improve the pedestrian experience and create opportunities for artists to present their work. We support this program and look forward to working with our partner agencies, as well as the city council, to create permanent pathways for art to be displayed on certain temporary construction fences, both city owned and private moving forward, provided that this shared goal can be achieved safely. Intro 1667 requires contractors, uh, contractors that are main mandated to create a plan relating to environmental conditions created by construction or demolition work to submit such plans and report additional information to the Department of Environmental Protection as well as the Department of Buildings. Contractors are, are already required to control for air contaminants and must mitigate noise during certain construction operations. Noise mitigation plans must be prepared and submitted to DEP online and contact information for the contractor providing work for which such plans has been submitted must be made publicly available at construction sites. 
DOB would welcome the opportunity to discuss this legislation further with this committee to better understand how these proposals interact with existing requirements contractors must already comply with. Intro 1737 establishes restrictions on issuance of after hour variances, which allows construction work to occur before 7 a.m., after 6 p.m., or on the weekends. Restrictions including placing limits on the hours that an AHV can be issued for, and the number of days an AHV can be requested. The legislation also requires reporting regarding the AHVs issued in the preceding year. We understand the impact construction has on a community and are committed to increasing transparency around the issuance of AHVs. On a weekly basis, the department already sends reports on AHVs issued to community members, including elected officials and community boards, so that they have relevant information about after hour construction going on in their neighborhoods. Additionally, the department has released an interactive map that shows the location of each construction project for which an AHV has been issued, including the dates for which such AHV was issued and the reason why it was issued. The COVID-19 pandemic has had an unprecedented impact on many industries, including the construction industry. As the department visited construction sites throughout the city last year to conduct proactive inspections, we found that many sites were closed for several months. The department urges this committee to consider the impacts placing restrictions on the issuance of AHVs would have on the recovery of the construction industry. We are committed to working with this committee and our industry partners to balance community interest with the need for construction to continue in a safe manner and look forward to discussing this issue further. Finally, intro 1939 requires certain new buildings, including nursing homes, adult homes, and assisted living facilities to be provided with standby power systems capable of providing power for at least 72 hours for certain building systems, including elevators, cooling and heating, refrigeration, and lighting. Standby power systems can improve safety in the event of an emergency, including a power outage. The department is supportive of this legislation, given that it can improve safety in a building that will house vulnerable populations, and we look forward to working together on this issue. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I would welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. I'll now turn it over to questions from Chair Gornagy, but first I want to acknowledge we are also joined by Council Members Shane, Cabrera, Gradenchik, and Cumbo. As a reminder, if other Council Members would like to ask a question, uh, just use the Zoom raise hand function and I'll call on you in order. Chair Gornagy. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. It's always great to see you. Uh, I have a few questions. I'm going to start with uh, intro 354, which, as you know, is a local law to amend the administrative code in relation to penalties for the, offer, the unauthorized alteration or demolition of premises calendared by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Uh, for some of us who are in increasingly gentrifying areas that have very valuable assets in our architecture and our property, Landmarks Preservation, has created a pathway to some level of preserving the, um, the integrity of, of communities, especially in brownstone and limestone areas like I represent. Uh, how, did, how do the Department of Buildings and Landmarks Preservation keep track of buildings that have been recommended for landmark status? And is there communication about that between the two offices? Certainly, thank you, Chair, for that great question. Yes, there is definitely a, a, a very robust level of communication between LPC and my agency. Um, we do at the Department of Buildings keep track of buildings that have been landmarked. Uh, that is information that's available to our plan examiners, um, as well as constant communication with the uh, LPC, with the Landmark Preservation Commission on buildings um, for which they are seeking calendaring. So can you if, you, if you don't mind, could you walk us through how both agencies or well, both offices communicate when a building is recommended for landmark status? Oh, I'm sorry. Certainly. When, so when, it, when, it's, when it's recommended for landmark status, I hate these, I hate these multi-level questions, but uh, when it's, when it's uh, recommended for landmark status, when inspections are conducted, and uh, when uh, permits are filed, like what is, what's the interaction generally uh, during those periods? Certainly. So, as you know, when LPC is advancing a project, um, we are made aware of uh, their calendaring of properties. Um, as it relates to the intersect of that work with our uh, 
uh, required review of applications. Um, we do uh, have a certain amount of period by which we're required to act should we have uh, plans filed. Now, um, when it comes to work on existing buildings, just to give a sort of a, a sense of the collaboration uh, throughout the city, obviously there are, are, are a number of properties that are landmarked. Um, we do ensure that we have that information of each individual building that is landmarked as well as those that are calendared so that our plan examiners who are reviewing any submittal are aware of the LPC designation. I will note that there are instances where work may be happening on a landmark property, for example, um, where permits are not required from the department, but uh, LPC uh, approval is required. And so there are certainly a heavy overlap, but there definitely are instances where our involvement is uh, limited um, to the extent where we're not issuing permits because the work uh, does not require that, but certainly LPC's approval uh, is always in place. Uh, so I'm curious, what triggers uh, a complaint of unauthorized alterations or demolition? Is it, is it inspections that trigger a complaint or is, is it reporting that triggers that complaint? Uh, typically, and I would say for any building in the city, typically um, uh, it is generated through a complaint from a member of the public, whether that be an elected official or, um, you know, any any sort of regular citizen calling in 311 where they see activity but don't see a permit uh, dis displayed publicly or even in instances where there is a public, but they, uh, sorry, a permit publicly displayed, but they believe that there is work going on that is beyond the scope of that permitted uh, work. That is typically um, how those complaints are, are made to the department. Uh, in 2019 and 2020, approximately how many properties were calendared by LPC for land <laughs> status? Or, or two? Uh, between Sure, between uh, that period, 2019 and 2020, there were um, 732 buildings uh, that were designated and calendared uh, as landmarks by the uh, LPC. How many of those properties had previously received complaints for unauthorized alterations or demolition work? Um, we are not aware of any complaints for unauthorized construction uh, involving any of those buildings. This is New York City, and there's some very unscrupulous people here. So I would I would find that hard to believe if it, during that calendar period, except for the fact that it was a difficult time during that period. So um, I, I'm a little surprised. Uh, how does DOB currently track buildings when unauthorized alterations and demolitions uh, have occurred? So again, broadly speaking, uh, for any property type across the city our typical pathway for complaints about that uh, uh, work of that nature is through 311. Uh, and then depending on the building type, there are certain actions that are required thereafter. Uh, if it is an occupied building, um, an occupied multiple dwelling, sorry, there are certain requirements that the council has placed through various pieces of legislation that will require us to take action on that owner uh, in different ways. So depending on the type, uh, a building, but always uh, uh, the way the complaint starts, our action starts, is um, through complaints generated by the public. And uh, does LPC have a role and or responsibility in that process? Our conversations with LPC, are, again, you know, we have many conversations with LPC around the buildings that they have calendared and or designated. And certainly if we were to find an instance uh, of a building that was designated, for example, as a landmark in the city where we had unauthorized construction, uh, we would certainly collaborate on enforcement because there are, you know, um, there would be uh, enforcement uh, likely on both ends. Uh, is, is, is this information uh, publicly available currently? <laughs> the information of the number of buildings where we've had complaints. Yes. Um, you know, I have to check to see if we have that information uh, in such a way that would be easy for the public to ascertain. And what's the current process for obtaining a DOB issued permit for demolishing or altering a building? So currently speaking, again, if it were broadly speaking, 
uh, a registered design professional would be applying to the Department of Buildings for an alteration, depending on the type. Uh, you'd be doing a major alteration or a minor alteration. And if it is a demolition of a property, you'd be applying for a full demolition of that property. So that would that would take you through a plan review process. Um, and following that, there are certain requirements um, that we have in place to ensure that the property is able, in the uh, example of a demolition, that the property is actually able to be demolished. Uh, so we would be doing inspections prior to demolition. Uh, to ensure all the conditions and the plans are there and that all the safety requirements we have are met. Um, should that happen, a permit would be issued and then the work would proceed from there. Um, so this, this is a, a rather substantive suite of bills. And I know that the administration has said that they're supportive of some and not supportive of others. On intro 354, where do you stand in terms of being supportive or not supportive? Uh, on intro 354, as it relates to increasing, uh, creating new penalties for altering or demolishing buildings, um, we certainly are supportive of any uh, such proposal that would um, strengthen our enforcement uh, abilities. Okay, and then uh, the other, what are the concerns about the other components to the bill that you're not supportive of? With respect to 354? Yes. I, I think we are, generally speaking, supportive of 354, period. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, I am going to allow for my colleagues to ask some questions, and I'll come back with a, with a second round on some of the other bills. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Carnegie. Um, I'll now call on, call on other members to ask questions, starting with sponsors of the bill we are, we are hearing today, of the bills we're hearing today, pardon me. Um, so far, we know that there are opening statements coming from council members Cumbo and Rosenthal, so we'll start there. Um, bill sponsors making openings will be limited to five minutes. Other council members, please keep your question to three minutes, including responses. If there's a second round of questioning, council member questions will be limited to two minutes. Council member Cumbo? Starting time. Thank you. Good morning. I first want to thank Chair Cornegie for putting together this hearing. This is really critical and I'm so glad and pleased um, that so many important bills in terms of improving um, the aesthetics, but most importantly, the safety of building and construction in the city of New York is prioritized at this time. Intro 1635 provides an opportunity for sidewalk sheds, or as most people know it, sidewalk scaffolding to be a blank canvas for artists. New York City is the cultural capital of the world and every square inch of it should be reflective of our, art, our artists, our creativity, our innovation. Art is synonymous with the city of New York. As currently written, the bill would require the Public Design Commission to solicit and approve four works of art from the public in consultation with the Department of Buildings and Department of Cultural Affairs. Building owners would be allowed to install these works of art instead of the standard green that dot our city's public spaces and are frankly quite boring, uninspiring, and really a wasted opportunity for the city of New York to explore and to imagine and to celebrate all of the creativity that makes up New York City. There is over 300 miles of scaffolding in New York City. Organizations like the Studio Museum in Harlem and Artbridge, thanks to DCLA City Canvas program, have already shown us the magnificent possibilities that our local artists can have on the urban pedestrian experience. I hope to see this bill improved and passed prior to the end of my term. The city needs and can have more vibrancy, more culture, and more opportunities for its artistic community through this legislation, beyond the drab green so ever present today. I am eager to hear suggestions on the bill from the public and our city agencies today. But I just wanna close by uh, thanking uh, Jason Herr, my legislative director. Uh, I wanna thank certainly uh, and Chair Cornegie for hosting this and seeing this as important during this really particular uh, time in our history. And I just wanna say, so many artists throughout the New York, throughout New York City are looking for so many ways to express themselves, to put
particular communities of color, scaffolding has been uh, a dark cloud over their community. It would be important for us to be able to open up the city with this vibrancy all throughout our 300 miles of available space. Thank you. I just want to add at this time, are we reading our opening statements and then doing questions or reading our opening statements and then going back for a round of questions? Uh, it's my understanding that you're reading your opening statement and then asking your questions if you like. Uh, but I have, right. a, I have a question for you. Um, uh, the, the bill. You have I a question for me, Council Member Cornegie? Yes, yes, Madam Majority Leader. It's a little unorthodox, but let's go for it. Exactly. This is, <laughs> how, I run my, this is how I run my hearings. <laughs> no, but in, in all seriousness, I know that art is curated uh, through time periods. Um, the, the bill doesn't specifically state the amount of time that, that you know, because these are regular artists. It's not, graf you know, graffiti art. With all due respect, it's not graffiti artists. These are, you're, you're proposing that, that, that regular um, uh, uh, artists, local artists get this opportunity. Were you, were you referring to curating this art in the same way with the same time frames? Uh, that are suggested in galleries. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you, yes. We, we had some technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Madam Majority Leader. You, your, your question got cut off. You were, you were talking about, um, you were talking about the magnificent talent of our graffiti artists throughout New York City. Go on. Absolutely. And whether or not your proposal includes the time frames that are generally associated with the curating of art in, in gallery spaces. So the way this legislation was planned or proposed would be after scaffolding can sometimes go up for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, or even a couple of months. So this would be, as was designed, this wouldn't be for like temporary for a week or two, or this would be more so for long-term um, projects that potentially three months or more um, would be eligible for this type of scaffolding um, with artistry um, superimposed on it. So th the goal for this would be for it to stay with the life of the scaffolding um, until it is taken down or removed. Um, the goal of this also would be, is we're hoping in New York City that we can create a way, particularly in our NYCHA and public housing developments, one, to beautify um, scaffolding, but also to create an environment where scaffolding is utilized, not as almost a permanent fixture of the architecture of the building, but that it's taken down rapidly as well. So this would be something to beautify the neighborhood for temporary uh, scaffolding projects and taken down, but with approvals from the Department of Cultural Affairs um, to ensure that it's reflective of the community um, where it's going to be seen as well as the Public Design Commission. Uh, so it, it, it is, I, again, I think the bill, the bill is great, but um, uh, not but. Ben Carlos and myself have worked diligently to decrease the amount of scaffolding that we're seeing. And I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to then think that, you know, their, their art isn't valued. Like we've, I've put in several pieces of legislation because scaffolding, unfortunately, in the city of New York has been used uh, not in its correct form in some instances. It's actually, you know, some developers have, have, have used it and would actually pay the fines and have the scaffolding up for, for, for way past the extended time than actually necessary repairs. So as we fight through that to make sure that we can provide safety uh, around scaffolding and that the scaffolding isn't being uh, used and used inappropriately, um, right. still a great program. So I, I look forward to working with you, make sure that we get the best out of uh, this opportunity. Thank you so much. And, you know, scaffolding is always going to be part of the construction process. I mean, New York City is going to continue to build. It's going to continue to demolish. It's going to continue to do. It's going to continue to go through that cycle. But essentially what this bill is saying is that that process does not have to be a blight on the community. It can be done in a way that during that time, that artwork is utilized for that purpose. Now, we're still going to be working out the logistics in terms of Will it be work that will be pre-printed and then imposed on the scaffolding? Or will artists create the work strictly right on to the, um, the wooden boards that are used for the scaffolding? So those types of dynamics have to still be worked out. 
I look forward to working with you on it, uh, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you. And just think about it in terms of schools that are in the nearby neighborhood that would be able to have their work, school children would be able to have their work on a mural um, in their community. We can have our senior centers doing work in their community. Uh, local artists would have an opportunity to reimagine how they see their space and to impose art within uh, the community space. So there's a lot of excitement um, that can happen there. So I'll, I'll just- Your energy, Your Honor, Majority Leader. <laughs> You know how I am. So is it is it time for me to ask the commissioner questions or do you still have questions for me, Chair Cornegy? <laughs> no, I think I think I'm done. Thank, I'm done. Thank you so much, Madam Majority Leader, for answering my questions. Thank you. So I just wanted to um, ask in terms of this particular legislation, I guess the, the million dollar question the million is how does the administration feel about this particular uh, legislation, intro 1635? Uh, so with respect to the intro, as I mentioned in my testimony, we're supportive of creating a permanent pathway for art uh, on both public and private properties uh, to be displayed on our temporary construction equipment. And how do you feel currently as the bill is written, it's to, not, to, not, not to my liking, but it's limited now at four. What do you think that the administration, what would be a comfortable number that the administration feels that they could ramp up to um, in order to be able to provide uh, this opportunity for artists in the community? I would say this, our involvement with beautification of uh, uh, temporary construction equipment, sidewalk sheds are the most common of them, um, has been through the City Canvas pilot program where obviously we're working very closely with uh, our colleagues at Cultural Affairs. I don't believe the Department of Buildings, while we fully support any opportunity to beautify uh, our temporary construction system, uh, equipment, pardon me. And I just do wanna say philosophically, we do believe that there is a very appropriate connection between um, taking what is required by code for public protection and allowing a community to enhance it and truly create a dynamic streets, streets, streetscape, pardon me, instead of just relying on the code required Hunter Green, uh, which is what our sheds are currently. So we're fundamentally in agreement. We do believe that things can be safe and beautiful at the same time and create dynamic streetscapes for a community to really celebrate their local artists uh, or you know, even more broadly. Um, I don't think, though, that it's really the Department of Buildings uh, place to talk about what is the level of uh, or number of uh, art uh, uh, sort of samples, if you will. I really I'm going to defer to my colleagues at DCA who uh, Department of Cultural Affairs, pardon me, who are far more uh, expert in that. Um, but I will say this. We are fundamentally supportive of the notion that uh, required safety uh, temporary equipment can, in fact, be um, additive to a community instead of taking uh, from them. Let Time me just expired. add, and I'll just add this one question and then move on. Um, do you have any experiences in terms of hearing or understanding feedback from the Art Bridge program? Was there some sort of assessment done to determine what were the pros and the cons of that program? Um, how was it received by the community or and or developers, landlords in terms of how this project was done and implemented? I don't know the specifics on whether somebody has looked back at the ArtBridge uh, pilot to see if there were pros or cons that have come from that. But I, I will say uh, that it is certainly true that I have heard from a handful of uh, uh, developers and other property owners who are generally interested in uh, finding a way uh, to enhance their required public protection, whether it be through art or a uh, loosening of um, uh, the code mandates on colors. And it is worth noting, the pilot is not over yet. We, we still do have a, a number of months left in the pilot. So there still is opportunity to see more and learn more. Um, but it is certainly true that, that we've heard interest from owners and, and property uh, you know, neighborhood associations 
um, that are definitely keenly interested on, on uh, in beautification for these structures. Okay. Um, well, thank you. If there's an opportunity for another round of questions, I'm here. Um, so I will turn it back over to Chair Carnegie. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Next up, I, I, I don't, I can't see, I think it's Margaret Chin. Uh, well, also I'm hearing an opening in questions from Council Member Rosenthal, followed by an opening in questions from Council Member Rivera. Thank you. Starting Great, time. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Carnegie, for holding this important hearing. And I really appreciated your questions about my bill. And uh, I will, I'd like to continue on those in one quick second. Commissioner, always great to see you. Appreciate your time and effort. Um, really appreciate the work that you're doing at Buildings. Uh, so intro 354 is a very straightforward mandate that applies penalties to unauthorized demolitions and alterations to building calendared for consideration uh, by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. I emphasize calendared because I'm getting across the point that it's already part of the city agency process. Over the years, a significant number of historic buildings in our city have been torn down or altered beyond recognition while they were being considered for protected status. Such actions are fundamentally criminal. My legislation targets developers who are determined to secure a site, so determined to secure a site that they'll defy a city order and illegally tear down that building or tear down the artifacts on the building which make it so special without consideration for its history or even for the safety of the community around it. Illegal demolitions take place at night without proper permits and sometimes without gas, electric, electricity or water shutoff. Developers are not above the law. We have a well-established process that's supposed to give the city and local communities an opportunity to consider whether a structure should be saved. New York City's built environment reflects our long and complicated history and the demolition of older buildings in the middle of the night is a matter of concern to all of us. Above all else, any demolition should be managed safely and in full view of the public. And let me give you one example, Commissioner. Um, during my tenure, I think in the first couple of years, uh, a, develop, a developer purchased a building even called the Carriage House um, with beautiful artifacts of uh, um, horses and, and sort of wreaths around them. Um, and even though that building was now used not as carriage house, but as bars um, or another one as a parking garage, um, they still reflected the history of our city. Um, but the developer in the middle of the night, despite the fact that the community and community groups had it landmarked um, on, on the calendar for landmarking, in the middle of the night, the developer just demolished um, the artifacts. And so, you know, I know penalties are harsh and I know these seem large, um, but the impact that these developers have, given that they're unscrupulous, I think, you know, they need to in some way be held accountable for the action. Obviously, what would be even better is if they stopped it and there were some way to have a system to do that. Um, sorry, I'm about to sneeze. But, you know, they do this in the middle of the night. It's not like even if we require, I mean, so they do it in the dead of night. Uh, they don't care about permits. And so we're looking for something that we can do. Um, and I appreciate Chair Carnegie's uh, comments about his district. Um, they're coming for you next, Chair Carnegie. Uh, so I'm curious what you think about this, Commissioner, and if you have ideas to make the bill even stronger or whether you, how you think we should proceed. 
So I hear the concern, right? And I think it's just important to stay up front. Yes, we are supportive of any uh, penalties or a penalty regime, if you will, um, that reinforces our commitment to ensuring that owners are held accountable when they do unpermitted work, period. Um, and so for that, we're supportive of the legislation. I do want to think a little more about whether there are opportunities to provide my agency with more tools um, to get at the heart of what you're addressing. Um, but as written, we are supportive of the legislation. Uh, what jumps off your head in terms of more tools? I'm always interested in that. Time expired. Um, uh, Chair, I, I want to I I think, think a little. I want to think a little more, Council Member, oh, okay. and come back to Great. you with a with a reasonable, responsible, uh, not knee jerk answer. Oh, terrific! I really appreciate. I'm I'm glad you're thinking about it, and I I appreciate that the agency would be supportive of this legislation. Thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Chair Carnegie. Thank you, Councilmember Rosendahl. Next, we'll hear from Councilmember Chin. Starting time. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Commissioner. Great to see you. Good morning. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about the, uh, the legislation that deals with um, after our permits. Um, that is a big issue in my district because there's so much, you know, construction going on. There's so much road work, con ed. So my question to you is that does the agency look at um, the kind of work and the amount of work that's go going on in a specific area when they issue after our permit? Are there any kind of coordination uh, so that we don't have a whole bunch of, you know, after our work in in one neighborhood at the same time. Because uh, I know that when you talk about, you know, recovery, yeah, I mean, a lot of project has started up. And in my district, we try to coordinate. And I, I know that your staff has been very helpful um, to try to make sure that um, quality of life uh, is maintained. So I just wanna see if the agency itself kind of look at, okay, after permits, after our permits coming in, and how many and in a specific area and to make sure that one neighborhood don't get inundated with so many of them. Sure, and, and thank you, uh, council member. Obviously, I know your, your neighborhood among, uh, among the neighborhoods in the, in the city certainly sees uh, its fair share of after our activity. And you know the reporting that we do currently uh, to members as well as the community board to ensure that they have the information at the time that we're getting it as well. So we do really want to uh, to continue to work on and strengthen that real time relationship uh, that we have. So we're obviously open to anything that allows us to continue that, deepen that, and uh, continues our commitment to transparency. Um, with respect to neighborhood, uh, uh, sort of a neighborhood level look, um, you know that there's a, a fair amount of work that occurs outside of the Department of Buildings uh, uh, purview. Um, you had mentioned street work, Con Ed. Um, typically that um, type of work does not come to the Department of Buildings for any sort of uh, oversight or approval. So with respect to that, no, we're, we're not able to do that level of cross-checking. Um, obviously, our borough commissioners and their teams are uh, committed to working with communities. So where we have concerns, we look at the uh, after our variances to ensure that the community's needs are being met. So you don't work interagency right now? There's no communication um, between like Department of Transportation, Department of Building when <clears throat> street works are being done? Again, you know, for projects that are street based, those types of projects are not permitted through the department. So we would not be ha uh, we would not have um, purview over that scope of work. But that being said, obviously, where we have concerns with the community um, <clears throat> or where we have concerns that community members are raising with respect to our work, certainly there are opportunities at that juncture where we are now bringing in our colleagues if we know other work is occurring to uh, find a path forward uh, that is uh, responsive to all, all needs. 
I'm expired. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because right now we <clears throat> we had to do it ourselves, um, the coordination. So I think it would be great, you know, great help if the agency themselves are also conscious of what this is happening and do some interagency coordination at the same time. Um, okay, thank you. We'll now circle back to any additional questions from Chair Carnegie, followed by a second round of questions from council members. Uh, yes, one second. I do have uh, <clears throat> a second round of questions. And, and my, my, my second round of questions, uh, Commissioner, would begin with uh, intro 1127, which, as you know, is a local order amend administrative code in the city of New York in relation to expediting permits. Um, how long does it currently take to obtain work permits from the city? And, and I'm saying that tongue in cheek because depending on who you ask, the time frame varies. I know that you've streamlined a lot of it, quite frankly, and for that we thank you, and have brought um, uh, some level of, of consistency to the process. On the books, though, on the, for the record, what is the, uh, the, the amount of time currently that it takes to obtain work permits? Sure, so, and, and thank you for the compliments, Chair. Obviously, every day is a work of, uh, uh, for us of, of getting better. So we are truly committed to increasing our service levels and seeing greater consistency across the board. With that requires greater transparency for the public, which is why we've released our customer service dashboard where any member of the public can go on our website and see what our service levels are for planned reviews um, based on their borough and then average citywide. Um, currently for new buildings or major alterations, uh, it takes on average five days for our, our first review, first action. Um, and then for more minor alterations, we're reviewing those plans within three days. Um, and then obviously permits can be applied for uh, once the plans are approved. But our first action times continue to be incredibly strong um, with, a, with a very uh, solid service level for our customers. And the amount of time for an existing project to continue and for a new project are similar? Correct. So as it stands today, um, an a applicant a record can decide how they want to pursue their project. What is the filing strategy that best meets their needs, whether that be all um, uh, potential permits, um, uh, uh, going for plan review together, whether it be um, parsing out the work based on their phasing schedule or the way in which they're bringing on their, um, uh, their construction trade. So again, we're here to meet the needs of our customers. So for any uh, uh, applications that come in for new permit reviews uh, or new reviews that would lead to a new permit, those service levels continue to remain at that average five to three days, depending on the type. Uh, so we've had a lot of conversations about um, the rate, the high rate of attrition actually in, in DOB um, and, and what impact that may have on processing uh, permits. Um, the, the reason I bring that up is because um, while on the books, there's, there's one thing, and I know that you're struggling to try to achieve that drive, um, I get a lot of requests in my office as the chair um, about expediting the process of a, of a permit, um, which is costing a developer an exorbitant amount of money because they can't get it through. Is there an expert, and, and I feel crazy asking this because you gave us the timeframes, but you know, on the other end of that, I'm, I'm getting a lot of calls about expediting. Is there an expediting process for permits and what would the criteria be for an expedited permit? Well, I would say two things. So uh, today, any applicant can come in and file uh, per, uh, their plan. So first step is you're filing your plans, which once approved leads to a permit. Any applicant can come in today and file with our professionally, under our professionally certified program, which allows registered design professionals to submit um, their plans, attest to the fact that they are fully code compliant, uh, as well as compliant with all other regulations of the city, state, federal level. Once that is done, permits are nearly instantaneously issued. So when it comes to expediting, we have tools that are available to all uh, uh, registered design professionals today to meet their need for 
speed. Um, and then again, if a uh, applicant wants to come in for full plan review, um, we do have very strong service levels to date. My hesitation and the opposition to the bill is it creates a tiered system where I have to put on hold, a, potentially have to put on hold a new filer because of an existing filer's uh, 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 additional permit types. Now, we all know construction comes in many different uh, slices across the city, you could be doing a minor alteration in your existing kitchen, which is, you know, one permit type potentially, or you could be building, you know, a hundred story uh, building, um, which obviously is going to require a host of uh, permits um, uh, for that project. At the end of the day, we want a owner and their design professional to lay out the course that is most appropriate for them. That may mean they come in and look to do foundation work prior to uh, uh, filing for other work types. That's perfectly fine, um, but I don't wanna penalize somebody who is coming in for their project, their kitchen renovation, their minor home renovation, uh, because I've gotta wait for somebody who has a certain trajectory that they wanna carry out for their project. So a long way of saying, I think our service levels are very strong. Uh, for first review. We obviously require um, quick turnaround time from the applicant. This is a this is a bit of a, it takes two to tango. Um, I'm committed to making sure our staff continues to deliver strong service levels. We can't act until we get a response uh, from the other side. So, um, so I think we're, uh, I think we are giving our customers exactly what they want the flexibility to decide the path for them and the service that is uh, uh, deserved for a city of this, of this size and statute. So that brings me to my next very obvious question is, um, would the DOB need additional staff to facilitate, um, facilitate or expedite permits? Um, and I mentioned before, uh, between you know, the level of, of attrition and turnover, also, um, these uh, cutbacks based on um, COVID spending and our nine to eleven billion dollar deficit last year, and the inability to to make new hires in this in this climate, um, all of that coupled seems as though it has a, a, a negative impact on the ability to, to expedite and or get built. Things things are backed up all over the city, right? This is not an indictment on DOB. Um, but my question would be, would, would additional staff in particular areas within your office uh, help uh, move things along faster, potentially? With respect to the bill as written, yes, there that would have a, a very significant impact on our staffing, on our service levels. And in order to maintain the service that we're providing at the levels we're providing, yes, we, that would have a significant staffing impact uh, and uh, impact on our existing resources. Um, with respect to more broadly, uh, certainly um, I would say this, we are fully staffed currently on plan, uh, at our plan exam levels. And yes, I am keenly aware of attrition uh, in the department uh, uh, for a host of reasons among them consistency and the ability to uh, maximize one's uh, work uh, potential. Um, that being said, should, uh, should the council seek to refine our service levels or create a tier of which we're talking about? Yes, resources would be strained in order to do that uh, and additional resources would be needed. So, um... Office um, portions of the bill, or just in the bill's entirety, are you? At is, uh, uh, as it is currently written, we are we are opposed to the bill uh, in its entirety as we are, as it is currently written. Again, if there is a, we believe that there is opportunities today to allow an applicant to uh, achieve a permit on their proposed work in a expeditious fashion. Uh, 
through our professional certification process, which again requires a registered design professional to attest to the uh, completeness of their plans as well as that their plans are compliant with all requirements. Uh, should an applicant go that route, uh, a permit is inst uh, issued nearly instantaneously. And when I say nearly inst inst instantaneously, we're talking about a day or so. That is extremely fast. Uh, when we are looking at uh, full plan review, again, we're looking at three to five days on average for first uh, action. Uh, if an applicant uh, turns that product around to us, addresses the objections, we see a pathway to approval very shortly thereafter. And we are looking at ways to identify uh, opportunities to strengthen the turnaround time. Certainly through the continued rollout of DOB Now, you'll see our ability to more precisely uh, narrow the universe on where the delays, if any, are, whether they be with my plan examiners and turning around an additional plan review, whether it be with the applicant, um, we can now measure how much time a plan spends at each course um, and monitor uh, and, and, and actually review um, how many times a plan has to get re-reviewed before approval. Those are tools we didn't have. So certainly you'll see a continued emphasis on strengthening that part of the universe, now that we have a large number of our work types on DOB now, we can actually do that level of due diligence to ensure we're continuing to press our service levels uh, and, and get the product out to the applicant much faster. Uh, uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I'm gonna move to colleagues and colleague, more colleague questions. Do you have any additional council member questions? Uh, uh, oh, yes. uh, if not, we can move on to testimony from the public. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our in-person council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant Arms will set the timer and announce you again. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. We will start by hearing from Ryan Monell, followed by Laura Rothrock and Stephen Pearson. Ryan, when you're ready. Starting time. One moment, sorry, we have it. We might have one council member question. Hey, uh, thank you. Thank you for touching that, Austin. I really appreciate it. As the commissioner, Still available? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, I'm on my I'm on my phone. Um, I wanted to ask about Councilmember Chin's bill, and just make the point that um, Commissioner, as you say, there are um, there is a lot of information that's pushed out by your office about after hour variances. And we've talked about this before. Um, and I, I always appreciate that information. My staff appreciates it. It's nice to have. Information is power. The problem is that, um, and I, I guess especially because of the pause and making up for that time, um, you know, the impact on the community is, is rough. Um, you know, the noise is incessant, it goes all night. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, I can see if the burden is too much um, for Council Member Chin's bill, but I really hope that there's a path to um, some sort of relief for the community. And um, I'm wondering if you're willing to go, I mean, I know this is Council Member Chin's question, but just sort of, if you're willing to think about other ideas, other ways to get relief to communities, um, some way of negotiating with this bill. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I was muted. 
Um, uh, yes, I think there is definitely opportunity for us to continue the conversation. As I mentioned in my testimony, you know, we have to we have to be mindful of the impacts that COVID had on uh, the city as a whole, but very narrowly for my universe, certainly the construction industry. That being said, I am keenly aware of concerns that communities have. Uh, you know, I used to be a member of my community board. I, you know, prior to being at DOB, spent a lot of time working time with uh, in neighborhoods on their concerns. So. I certainly understand and value that, and I do believe that it is, uh, you know, truly incumbent on this committee to think through the potential impacts to the industry. But we, but as a department, we do believe that there can be a balancing uh, of both needs, um, so that we can ensure construction work continues safely. And that does mean sometimes uh, through the use of after-hour variants. Um, uh, but to your sort of broad question about whether we're willing and able to continue the conversation to find a path forward, yes, yeah, certainly the, this department stands ready to uh, engage in conversation with the committee, as well as our partners in the industry and certainly uh, communities across the city to identify ways to ensure construction always occurs safely. That will always be our primary concern. Um, but where we can be responsive to the needs of, of the communities as a whole. And, you know, I think it has been a particularly rough year because families are home. So to the extent that kids have been remote learning at home, construction going on all day, and then it continues all night, night after night after night, it's sort of just a bad confluence of events. Um, and... Uh, you know, but we really do have to support our families as well. Thank you very much. Appreciate your, your help. Thank you. And thank you, Austin, for noticing my hand. No problem. Give us just one moment here. We're sorting one thing out on the back end. Just bear with us here one moment. All right, we're moving on to public testimony. So as previously planned, we will start by hearing wait, from- wait. I'm, I'm sorry, Austin. Um, one of one of the um, uh, uh, Councilmember Rivera, who also wants to make public comment on and ask questions, mm -hmm. uh, won't be on until a few minutes later at 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 um, at twelve. But she wants to know if the commissioner is available, or she has to run. We may have just lost the commissioner, but we can reach out on our end and see if the commissioner can return. Um, if not, we can take Councilmember Rivera's questions and ask them to the commissioner after the hearing. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, so we will be hearing from Ryan Manel, followed by Laura Rothrock and Stephen Pearson. Ryan, this time for real. <laughs> thanks, Austin, and thanks, uh, Chair Carnegie, uh, for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Ryan Manel, representing the Real Estate Board of New York. Uh, we did submit testimony that's fairly comprehensive um, in regards to the majority of the bills on the on the docket today. Uh, able to share that with uh, council member officers after the call or after the hearing. Um, I do want to uh, hone in on two bills that we have um, particular concerns with. 
Uh, first is the after our variances legislation intro 1737. I, I think, you know, we do appreciate absolutely the concerns that are being raised, particularly from Councilwoman Chan and Councilwoman Rosenthal. Uh, and we want to be partners in making sure that quality of life surrounding construction projects is, um, you know, taken into consideration in regards to how we can improve uh, situations in regards to noise, uh, air pollution, et cetera, that we can address. Uh, I would say though that 1737 is not the solution to those problems. Uh, and in fact, um, particularly as we're trying to come out of the pandemic and create jobs uh, and economic development throughout the city, uh, limiting construction uh, through uh, eliminating after our variance opportunities uh, is particularly concerning. Um, not only from a perspective of, of economic development, but also, as you can imagine, you know, some situations which require uh, work to be done after hours is imperative to the safety of the public. Uh, and so doing um, what we feel is, is a blanket uh, elimination of after hours opportunities uh, really goes in the wrong direction. Um, not to mention, as Councilwoman Rosenthal, I think, alluded to, you know, it is quite... Um, conflated right now in regards to uh, folks being at home, uh, what constitutes um, after hours anymore. Uh, and I think that needs to be taken into consideration as well. So uh, we look forward to finding opportunities to work with both the council and DOB to, to find solutions, but uh, we believe intro 1737 uh, is not that solution. Uh, in regard to, and I'll leave it at that and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Ryan. Next, we'll be hearing from Laura Rothrock, followed by Stephen Pearson and Joelis Silva. Laura. Start in time. Good morning, Chair Carnegie and members of the City Council. My name is Laura Rothrock. I'm providing testimony today on behalf of the New York Coalition of Code Consultants, also known as NYCCC. We're a nonprofit trade organization, and we specialize in securing construction and development approvals and building code and zoning consulting. Um, and we appreciate the ability to provide feedback on these bills today. Regarding intro 354, we understand the intent, but the way that the bill is written, any alteration on any on a building calendar for landmarks would have steep penalties. And because the term major alteration is not defined, this could include interior work that needs to be done for safety reasons. Um, and so the description of the bill explains that the penalty would apply to work without a permit, but when you read the actual language of the bill, it states that a penalty would apply to any work. So we're gonna need clarification on that. Um, and while we support intro 1127 in theory, that's the one that requires DOB to expedite permits. We recognize that the 24 hour turnaround, especially for complex construction um, is, is, is difficult to achieve. Um, and intro 1737 that is limits and reduces the after hour variance permits. You know, the reason these variances are approved is because construction activity is not safe during regular business hours. And so after 15 days, the safety is issue will not necessarily disappear um, and public safety should remain paramount. So, you know, as Ryan said, this bill would adversely affect the ability to, com to complete construction sensibly during a time when the industry needs support during our city's recovery. And finally on intro 1667, which requires DOP environmental monitoring report to be publicly accessible, our industry would like clarification on how this process would work. Would another document required be required to be uploaded prior to permit release? This process would be another delay on the already complex process for a little gain that, that we could see. Thank you for your consideration and we welcome the ability to discuss with you further. Thanks, Laura. Uh, we'll next hear from Stephen Pearson, followed by Joalis Silva and Lyric Thompson. Stephen? Starting Thank time. You. Thank you. I'm Stephen Pearson from Artbridge, a public art nonprofit. I'd like to comment on intro 1635 as Artbridge is implementing the City Canvas Pilot Program, which enables art installations on construction sites. Over the past 21 months through City Canvas, we've exhibited 38 local artists at 17 sites installing more than 12,000 square feet of art. At the most basic level, City Canvas provides incredible exposure for local artists while making art accessible to all New Yorkers. However, I do believe that public art offers so much more potential than simply beautifying the city or showing off the work of talented artists. City Canvas has worked best for us when we've enabled artists to be collaborators 
and community builders. Central to our city canvas implementation has been our citywide program with NYCHA residents. At each site, we work with residents to select local artists from an open call. Often the artists are themselves NYCHA residents. We then build a months long program of engagement between the artists and residents, partnering with local community groups and hiring residents to facilitate all this. Through this process, the artists create large scale artworks that amplify the complex voices of residents, their problems, their accomplishments, their joys, and even their humor. It's a way to use art to empower NYCHA residents to control the way their lives are described and to control their own public living spaces. Site specificity is everything in public art. What works in the South Bronx won't make any sense in Eastern Queens. If written and implemented properly, intro 1635 can allow for these site specific collaborative exhibitions across the city. It's my hope that through this legislation, the city's 300 miles of construction fencing can be used to strengthen the voices of communities through artists. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, next, we'll hear from Joella Silva, followed by Lyric Thompson and Joel Cooperman. Start in time. Hi, um, my name is Joella Silva. I'm an artist and resident of NYCHA Jacob Reese Houses. I was commissioned as an artist fellow by ARPERS to create artworks for my community. Um, and I'm just, I'm beyond happy to be able to say that I was a part of this project. Um, I was blessed with the opportunity to create something that has actually tangible, that has visibly lifted the morale within my community. The connection I have to my community is now very obvious, evident even, and I have City Canvas to thank for that, as well as Art Bridge. These times have been especially difficult for us, and this work has given us visibility. This work was an act of love. This work has been affirming, and it's been uplifting. The resilience and the adversity that has been prevalent in my community is being commemorated in our very own space, and that has been monumental for us. Since these pieces have been up, the interactions that I've witnessed have ranged from sentimental to joyful, and they've made room for hard conversations. They've made room for the possibility of moving past some of our traumas. And they've even opened doors for who I am and can be as an artist. Because of all that, I truly believe this program is vital and therapeutic even. I believe that it serves as a lifeline to a community like mine, and I'm very grateful. Thank you, Joel. Uh, next, we're hearing from Lyric Thompson, followed by Joel Cooperman and Manjari Sharma. Lyric. Start in time. Hi, can you hear me? All right. Hello, I'm Lyric Thompson, and I'd like to speak about egress doors. Councilmember Cornegy, you have promised me that you would call for an oversight hearing regarding HPD's lack of enforcement of our fire standards for egress doors. You told me this two years ago, yet to date, you have done nothing but ghost us. This is a problem that isn't only isolated in our building. 68% of NYCHA buildings have issues with egress doors. This is an issue that is both expensive and dangerous for not only the tenants that live in these buildings, but the firefighters that have to show up and put out the fires due to shoddy construction work. So. I'm asking you now, when are you going to do this? Or are you never going to do this? Do we need to wait till we have another chair of housing? I mean, you're the chair, it's your job, Robert. Thank you, Lyric, we've called for that hearing. That hearing will be upcoming before I'm out of office. I look forward to it and I'm gonna hold you to it. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we'll hear from Joel Cooperman followed by Manjari Sharma, Joel. Starting time. Thank you very much for having this hearing. I'm the executive director of the Environmental Justice Initiative and have been dealing with bad construction sites in the city for the last 20 years. I just want to point out that there's a systematic underassessment and enforcement of what happens at unfettered construction, especially now that COVID-19 brings heightened concern about adverse disparate effects Air pollution increases vulnerability, especially on environmental justice neighborhoods. Beware of the word expedite. 
It encourages cutting corners. It's used as an excuse by contractors, including federally and city funded contractors, as an excuse to give up on the safety rules and the health rules and the monitoring. The air monitoring now at most construction sites is insufficient. The tenant protection law the city council passed is not being enforced. Cursive um, insufficient plans are being accepted. Um, more monitoring is required for brownfields in the city than where people live. The insufficient community monitoring plans require more intensive provisions for particulate matter, VOCs and lead, which is unearthed at construction sites. We have a, still have a lead problem in New York. The Tenant Protection Bureau does not have technical expertise, they claimed. And they also said that they could only know that a site has, has toxic problems if it has an E designation. Most housing sites, including NYCHA, do not have an E designation. So there's definitely an underassessment and underprotection that's there. Part of the problem with NYCHA housing is that when we, to NYCHA tenants have called 311 to make a complaint to buildings department, they're told that NYCHA residents cannot get the services of the city, including department of buildings, and they refer to NYCHA. This is environmental apartheid. I think you should investigate 311 this, this, this does relate to all the things that you're talking about here in terms of tenant protection or people complaining when they can't even make the complaints. Also, you're talking about the reports. Can I, can I just get to one more minute, please? Since I waited. Uh, yes, sir, please. Okay. There's a time lag. We need the information about exceedances at sites immediately or you know, not a year later. That's the one way to stop bad construction, all right? The problem is that they do the construction, a year later we get it, and then there might be a fine imposed. The fine system is not working. The city has over a billion to a billion and a half of uncollected fines. A $300 fine on a million dollar construction does not work. What the city has to use is their bad actor policy. And this Department of Buildings is not enforcing that. When there's a problem, there's, there's a provision for aggravated violations. They're not using that all the time. And part of it is, is that when they have that, a few aggravated violations and reaches a certain level, they should not be getting any more permits. And not only that, the city should not be hiring or leasing from these people. We're having people putting pollution into the, into the neighborhood and the city rewards them by giving them leases and the like. All right, there's an easy way to, you know, to stop that is, is really tightening up the bad actor policy that the Department of Buildings can use and should do. Also, there's a problem with air monitoring is that the city's paid for, the air monitors are stationary. They're not placed, they're not mobilized around the construction site. We need that information to find out what a site is doing and not doing to make up for the self-certification that they're holding handheld monitors and saying that there's no air pollution. And when there are exceedances, they say it's not, it's not detrimental. So I think it's important that you look into monitoring that the city should be enforcing a monitoring program, especially in neighborhoods where there's a lot of construction going on and people have bad past records, all right? And I think it's also, it's need to confer with other agencies. There's a lot of requirements that a construction site has to fulfill and the Department of Buildings is not looking to DEC for, for stormwater management problems. A lot of times there's runoff at sites, all right? So you can't find all this information in two, three days. So I just wanna say as an environmental attorney and a civil rights attorney and public health attorney, the word expedite is very scary. All right, and we should slow things down a little more, especially with COVID. And also, the word is out there that that you know that um, there's less inspections. And also, we're concerned about Department of Buildings is not supervising school construction authority inspections. I believe those files where the schools construction authority said there was 1,700 schools, um, you know, fine with ventilation. Those reports were not there. So there's a lot more the Department of Buildings could do. And I think it's important that, you know, um, you listen to public health people and, uh, and, and there's a health um, problem in, in the city and a lot of it's coming from unfettered construction. Thank you. So, uh, I wanna thank you for your, your testimony and ask you if you've submitted that and those recommendations in writing. I will. All right, thank you so much. Okay, and, and I also believe that, you know, there should be, um, also to just let you know that this, this state and, and federal agencies, and we've been working with NYCHA, including the federal monitor, and this, the city is not doing their job to protecting all those NYCHA residents, including the Department of Buildings and HPD.
All right. Thank you. And, and, I really, I really need what you said written, though. Thank you. Okay. So I can go through it if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Manjari Sharma, followed by Maria Lupianes. Hello. Yeah, Hi. How are you? Uh, my name is Manjari Sharma, and I am. Um, well, I'm born and raised in Mumbai, but I am, uh, you know, a uh, New Yorker. And um, I just want to talk passionately uh, in favor of the City Canvas program. Um, I've been an artist for 20 years. I pour my energy and emotion into uh, my art. And I just want to advocate for how important it is, the timeliness of uh, a, an open call. Um, you know, there's 300 miles of staggering amounts of scaffolding and um, an art bridge. I'm on the board of art bridge, but I'm here to speak as an artist. An art bridge announces these really timely calls for the artists and, and with an emphasis on local artists. And this art finds, finds its space within the community on, on these scaffoldings. And this is extremely crucial because the timeliness of this is what's important. If we can keep this going and we can keep a space for the artist, the local artist, not to just find place inside gal galleries and museums, but on the street, this is this is critical. And I and I hope that the City Canvas program will continue. Um, and Artbridge has done a phenomenal job on giving a voice and a space to the local artist. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, we get to the next person. I just want to take a second. Um, one, to thank, uh, especially our artists who are on today, who took the time to spend time with us and give us their, their, their thoughts. I think it's incredibly important. The arts and culture portion of recovery and resiliency isn't talked about much, but I believe that this is a real true component to recovery and resiliency. That those two words get thrown around a lot uh, uh, for, for post-pandemic, but a post-pandemic that is free from art and culture as a part of recovery and resiliency is a failed policy. So thank you for, thank you for, um, obviously the majority leader believes that, I believe that, Jimmy Van Bramer believes that. So there's a few of us who really believe in uh, the vibrancy of art as it plays a part in our recovery and resiliency. So thank you so much. Uh, and before we move on, I just want to say that unfortunately for me, this is um, uh, the, the, the uh, committee council's Austin Bramford's last hearing. And I really wanted to say this while the uh, commissioner was here, how grateful I've been for the way that he's worked within our community, how he's got me organized and kept us going. He's leaving some incredibly big shoes to fill. Austin, we really, really appreciate you. And um, uh, big, big, big shout out to you and, and prayers and blessings for the endeavors that you seek in the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Renegade. It's been a pleasure. Appreciate you, Austin, honestly. Thank you. Um, we do have one more panelist, um, but before- Oh man, I can say that soliloquy to the last panelist, I'm sorry. It's okay, <laughs> don't worry. Um, thank you so much again. Um, we have one question from Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you, thank you so much. Sorry, double multitasking here. Um, Joel, uh, I just wanna commend you for your consistent, um, you know, um, attention to the plight of tenants and the, um, you know, the difficulty that they have to live through when particularly unscrupulous building owners, uh, you know, do construction while they're in their homes and, and all, all sorts of problems. You've been incredibly helpful to me in thinking through some legislation. We're hoping to come forward with a little bit more. Um, but one thing I wanna point out just for uh, the record is that the hiring freeze that has been uh, citywide and you know for all agencies um, with three, every three people leaving, one person is rehired and I know um, that the mayor is changing that for the next fiscal year. But here, what you've described are the implications of this hiring freeze, that by not uh, hiring building inspectors when they leave, it means that fewer buildings can be inspected. And I think that 
you know, after we passed a whole slew of bills in the um, stand for tenant safety package, one of the bills, I think it was council member Levin's bill brought in a lot more staff to do inspections um, and to do them quickly. And, you know, that, that worked for a while, but when we, um, you know, can't hire enough staff to do this work, the implications are tenants suffer. And so again, it's why I just want to commend you for your um, constant, persistent uh, bringing attention to this matter. It's incredibly important. So, so thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to working with the committee and the committee's council. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, we're going to be hearing from Maria Lucas. Maria? Hi. Um, hello? Hi. Um, so I'm a local artist um, who lives in New York City. Um, I actually reside in NYCHA housing. Um, I participated as part of the Art Bridge um, residency program, and I did a mural in the city. So I'm just lobbying just to um, continue like these murals and artworks going on in the city, but not just to only make it temporary installations because like the mural that we did is supposed to be temporary since it's on scaffolding, um, but to also make it more permanent. You know, I don't know, I know like the scaffolding around my residence, I live in the Chelsea area, um, has been up for <laughs> as long as I've been here. Um, and I've been here for a little over two years now. And I don't know how much longer the scaffolding is gonna be up, but I would at least like to see artwork on there um, while the scaffolding is around. You know, I don't, I wouldn't um, like to go back to seeing plain scaffolding. Um, I think it's important in the community, especially, um, you know, I just got so much feedback from my neighbors and portraits that I painted um, about the positive impact that it had on them, you know, seeing um, artwork, seeing like something positive in the neighborhood. So, and I think, you know, we need to like spread this, you know, I love how there's this big movement going on, um, but again, it's a lot of it is temporary, you know, and I would like, uh, you know, some of it, especially on the scaffolding part to be more permanent, you know. Um, and that's it. I thank you so much for giving me um, your time. I also thank you for your support in the arts. Um, uh, Mr. Carnegie, you spoke um, very um, favorably about it. And, you know, we definitely like appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sharma. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you. Um, this concludes our public testimony. If you've inadvertently forgotten to call on someone to testify, if that person could raise their hand using the Zoom raise hand function, we'll try to hear from you right now. All right, seeing none, I'll now turn it back to Chair Cornegie to close the hearing. Uh, again, thank you so much, Austin, for your great work at the council. Uh, we wish you Godspeed going forward. And if there's anything that this office or myself or my office in the council can do to help, I will gladly do that. This commences the hearing on housing and building scheduled for the fourth. And as corny as it may sound, may the fourth be with you. <laughs> thank you.